are live. It is Sunday and we are excited to share this day with you. We are excited to be in God's presence. We are excited to meet, well, the few of us in my house. And we are excited to be able to share this online. Please tell us in the chat where you are from. It is for us, it's so exciting to see where you are from all over the world. We have people in the States waking up early. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I, I wouldn't. But but I will just catch the. But we are, grateful. We are, we are very grateful. grateful. For them. We very are very grateful. very grateful for them. Um, I am especially very thankful. My family and I are, are especially very thankful today. We were coming back from Hermanas. We had a few days away um, last week, just for, before the school starts again tomorrow, and um, and on our way back we were heavily loaded with a big bus, f with four children and a helper and a big trailer filled with bikes and lots of stuff, and um, suddenly on our way on the Solaris Pass Road, on the pass, on our way up just before you go down again into Somerset West, um, our car just, it, it, it felt like it didn't want to go into any gear, it had no power, and it stopped just right there in the middle of the road, around a corner, and cars were coming, they were coming at a pace, because they're building up their speed to get up that hill, so they were coming around the corner, and we were just immediately, when it happened, I said to my boys, let's pray now, because we have we have no way to get out of there. We can't even wait for help to come because it will take forever. And we're, st we're in the middle of the road and the sun is setting. It's getting dark. Um, and immediately Leon just said, Father, in the name of Jesus, we are getting out of here. Like, I don't know what he prayed, but he just prayed. And the next moment, we, when I looked up, there was a car who's, who stood in front of us, a big bucky. Um, there to help us with a young guy, 18 years old. And then he didn't have a rope. He asked us if we had a rope. We were like, we don't have a rope. And then he just, sh he, people were passing us by and he just showed to some guy he needed a rope and he pulled off and he gave us a rope and he was able to, to bring us to our house. Um, and so many cars were coming onto us and we were just praying the whole time. They were coming at such a speed. We were causing so many other accidents almost because we were in the middle of the road and people don't see us. So they're coming at a pace. Now suddenly have to go into another lane. Um, and through this, my baby slept. Everything was amazing. And we, we got home safely, which was a miracle. We, we th last night we were speaking about the fact that if you think about what could have happened, it's just you don't even want to go there. It, we're on a mountain. It's like, no. But thank you, Jesus. We have a God who is a protector and a provider because he provided in such an incredible way. Um, even though the rope broke twice, we got here safely and the God is good. So just give Jesus Amen. a hand. Hallelujah. Amen. Over to you. All right. Good morning, church. It's great to be with you. Thanks for joining us from wherever you are joining us from. And please feel welcome. We're uh, glad for the technology that we can do this, but we also can't wait to gather again. It's going to be awesome, but welcome. Uh, a few of our people were going to be here today to help and to just be with us in our home, and uh, they phoned to say they don't feel so well, they're ill. Uh, so if you are also not feeling great or going through a bit of a health thing, uh, we want to pray for you and for them right now. <laughs> mm. Lord Jesus, Amen. I thank you that we can lift up the people in our community, mm. in our church to you right now. and just mm. ask, Lord, that you will come, that you will touch them and heal them. Mm. Uh, these things that are coming, um, the weather has been <laughs> all over the place. Mm. Our immune systems may not be what they're supposed to be. But Lord, you are the healer and nothing is impossible for Amen. you. So we stand in agreement with our friends and our spiritual family right now, wherever they may be, at home, around this country, or even international. And we ask, mm. Lord, that you put your hand on them and that you will heal them Amen. in the name of Jesus. We mm. thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. Amen. And just like my wife gave a praise report now of what Jesus did for us yesterday, uh, please share your praise reports with us. Amen. And we can even share those on Sunday mornings as we do church because uh, it's always encouraging to other people to hear how God uh, did miraculous things in our lives. Amen. All right. So as usual, uh, you can follow along on the YouVersion Bible app today. We've got the, the sermon there, all the notes, the scriptures. So please go. If you don't have the YouVersion Bible app, just search for it on your store, iOS, Android. It's all there. And uh, you can sign up quickly and go to uh, Love Key. Uh, under events on the app, you, will, you can search for Love Key Church and you you'll, should be able to find our uh, event for today. And it's just a great way for you to stay connected and be engaged, make notes, and um, yeah, just remember what is happening here today. Uh, we would love for you to follow us on social media and engage with us there as well. We have a 
Facebook page, Love Key Church, obviously, and uh, we're also on Instagram. So please, we would love for you to follow us there. Uh, it's also another way for us to make sure you are connected and know what's going on. We do send out WhatsApps. We do send out uh, emails, but a lot of people miss those. So that's another way for you to just be in contact. Also, where you can have a sense of community and send us messages and be in touch with us. Uh, if you are having a birthday or had a birthday, uh, we would like to say happy birthday. I know that in our church, Christelle van der Heerfel had her birthday this week. So happy birthday, Christelle. And um, everyone else that is having a birthday or an anniversary from us, Love Key Church, happy anniversary, happy birthday. Jean- May it be Jean-Tay. blessed and go from strength to strength. Jonte, she's having a party today. Jonte so. is having her birthday. Yeah, oh. the England Brass daughter. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what day, but happy birthday, Jonte. Mm. That rhymes. That's yeah. very fortunate. Yay. Uh, <laughs> yay. yay. <laughs> it's Sunday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yay, yay. Okay. All right. So <laughs> there's two, uh, two things I want to quickly tell you about that I feel is very important. The one is that we have put on hold trying to find a... Um, We've, tried to, we've, we've put on hold trying to find a venue for right now. We are trusting God to show us the right venue at the right time. And then we trust that He will put those things in place. So, but we also want to be prepared and we want to be ready. So we, want to, we have started what we're just calling the new venue fund. <laughs> and because uh, there will be costs involved, there'll be rent, there'll be, we need to buy some chairs, we need to be able to put things together, fix things up, whatever the case might be with whatever the venue is. And we've created a separate account where we want to save up some money to be able to do that. So if you feel led by God to contribute to this fund, you can just send uh, that funds to the normal EFT information that's on this post and on our website and just mark it as a reference, uh, new venue fund or NVF, however you want to, and we will then move those funds to the right. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm so sorry about that. We seem to have had a drop in the internet connection. Um, I was just, you know, being grateful for the technology, but sometimes even that fails. <laughs> um, anyway, so that was the last note. It's just, if you want to contribute to our new venue fund or to our benevolence fund, you can do that. We have connect groups that are still running, even though it is uh, locked down because it's a very small gathering, and you can join any one of those groups either in Strand, Somerset West, or in Durbanville. And if you also are already here locally and part of our community, and you feel led that you want to be a group leader, you can just let us know, and we'll chat to you and build a relationship with you, and eventually we can start one with you as well. Um, All right, if you want to know what our church is all about, what our heart is and our focus is, there's an extensive uh, explanation in the YouVersion Bible app that I wrote there that you can go and check out. But in, in essence, our heart is to see that people encounter God, align with His purposes, and reign in life, and help others to do the same. We believe that is how a nation can be changed. And if you want to be a part of this, we want to invite you to fill out an offer to serve. And there's a Google Form link in this post that you can go to. Uh, and if you come to church, you can talk to us or Uh, When you register for the service, you can also sign up for an offer to serve. And these are different ways that you can use your natural talents and your spiritual talents, spiritual gifts to serve the local community. We believe that church is not a place where you go to be entertained and to just get something. It is a place where you need to be committed and be a part of and serve because that's what God has called us all to do. We want to ask you to pray for us as a family, for us as a ministry, and for those people in our church. We are, we believe that we are doing what God has called us to do, and we are super excited about it. But we also know at the same time that the spiritual warfare we face is very real, and that there's an enemy that wants to stop what God is doing. So we want to ask that you will pray for my wife and I, our family, um, that you will help us to 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 do the things that we need to do. We ask for prayer for wisdom, discernment, for leadership, um, and to bring the truth of the Word of God every time, never never compromising. And also for those who are in our church, that are in your church, (laughs) that you'll pray for your fellow brothers and sisters in the spiritual family. Prayer is powerful, and you need to know that. Another way that you can serve this community is by partnering with us financially. 
And we have many different ways that you can partner with us. Right now on the screen, you will see even Snapscan, Zapper. Uh, there's a link to Cheerful Giver that you can use to do that. These are easy ways for you to just go, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to give? How can I serve this church, this community, and just be obedient? We call you to just be obedient with what God is leading you to do. And uh, so, yeah, we, we, we invite you to bring your tithe into the storehouse, to, to bring your offering into what God is doing, and to partner with this ministry as we do what God has called us to do. And we believe that when you partner with us, that you are being part of something that is here to reach more people with the gospel message, that positively impacts marriages and families, that promotes unity in the body of Christ, play a role in eradicating fatherlessness, shine a light on the crisis of cultural Christianity, and sow into what we hope will be a future uh, social justice project in our local communities. And you can also know that we believe in sowing into ministries that are operating in Israel, leading people to Jesus. Those are all the things that you can know that you are sowing into when you partner with this ministry. All right, we're going to get into worship, praise and worship. We're super excited to be together today. I want you to prepare your heart now already and know that today the message is all about helping us understand that one of the biggest ways the enemy gets us to not move in the fullness of our identity in Christ is by putting a whole bunch of idols in the way. Things that we don't even realize, maybe things that are standing in the way of us worshiping God fully, that He is our first love. And I want to ask that even in the scripture and as we sing these songs, that you will come with a humble heart, prepared and ready to communicate with God, to have an encounter with Him, to be ready to hear from Him. And when He shows, the Holy Spirit shows you, listen, this is an idol in your life. This is a, a God that you are serving instead of the real living God. And to identify those things and to let go. Amen? Are you ready? We are going to worship the King of Kings. The scripture for today is Isaiah 42, verse 10 to 13. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song and His praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them, let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. The villages that Kedar in inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare His praise in the coastlands. The the Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. This is the God we serve. He has done great things and we worship him and we honor him in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, sorry. Technical issue. I just need to quickly help my wife here. <laughs> Before we play the track, I can help you. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Luckily, I remember how that works. There we go. You did well done. Is it working? Yes. All right. All right, let's worship the King of Kings. Let's sing unto Him with everything that we have. Let's make His name great. Let's lift Him up because He has done great things and He will do great things. Amen. Great. 
Who else answers? Come on. Who else answers when I pray?
to the coming King, to the great I am, to you I sing, for you're the one who reigns within my heart. I will serve, and I will serve no serve them. In Jesus' name. And I will serve no foreign God, nor any other treasure. For you are my heart's desire. The Spirit with a surrender to you in this moment. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my Laying down my rights, I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life.
come to you in this moment as we choose to humble ourselves before you and to say that your will be done. We want to make you our first love. I ask Holy Spirit that you will help us to truly humble ourselves, to truly come to you with an open heart, with good soil for your seed of your word to find good soil today. Lord, we have never truly arrived until we get to heaven and your glory. So Lord, there's always more to learn. There's always more to grow. And in this moment, we ask that you will help us through your word this morning. I thank you for this word. And I thank you that it will find good soil and that it will bring people closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Did we not have lyrics for that last song? Okay. That's my fault. I'm, I apologize. But hopefully you caught on, and if you're my age and you were a Christian in the, in the 90s, you should know it. <laughs> All right. So, as you may remember, last week we had a very special prayer meeting, um, praying for our nation, and we still continue to pray for our nation, for the peace of our nation, for godly governance, and for all these things to come into place. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that. But before that, we were busy with a series called Foundations, and we have been building and building and building the foundations that we believe are very important scriptural foundations for all Christians to have. But obviously, as our local community of Love Key Church, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, 
the pages from this book. <laughs> and, uh, and that we live according to what God says about the important things. And we have discussed already repentance, salvation, faith, lordship and obedience, water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, spiritual family. And we want to encourage you to, if you've missed any of these, to please go back, listen to the message on the podcast or on the Facebook page or the YouTube channel. We have made it very easy for you. It's available everywhere. <laughs> All you have to do is to make time to, do, to work through these messages. Why? Because I believe that God has been leading us to a place where we can understand why these foundations are important, not just hear them. This is the important thing, guys. We can't just hear these messages and just go to next Sunday, listen to another message, listen to another message, and never apply the Word of God to our lives, because then nothing changes. Then all we are are consumers of the Word of God. We are not really engaging with the Word of God. So I want to invite you, if you have been, only been listening, go back, listen again, or go through your notes and, and say, Lord, I want to not just listen, I want to apply this to my life and make it a part of who you are. Because if we have these foundations in place, and when I say in place, I don't mean just understanding them cognitively. I mean you have applied them and you are living them out each day. And even though you don't get it right day one, day two, you are constantly in intimate relationship with God, growing in all of these areas, amen, and understanding them. Why? Because this, these things impact your identity, your purpose, your marriage, your family, and your community. So we are now starting a new series called Impact because we're going to start talking about how do these foundations actually impact our lives. And once again, it can only impact your life if you choose to apply it, if you choose to be obedient to the Word of God. Amen? I'm going to keep saying that because sometimes it only lands the hundredth time you hear it. <laughs> So I want you to know that application of the Word of God is what it's all about. I'll remind you, I've said this once before, that the parable that Jesus told about the man who built his house on the sand and the one who built his house on the rock is not about just believing in Jesus. It's about doing what He says. When you hear His Word and don't do it, that is like building your house on the sand. But when you hear the Word and do it, that is when you build your house on the rock. And we have now laid a foundation, but the foundation is only as strong as our obedience. Amen? But now we want to see if we are obedient and we are walking in the fullness of, the, of this, how does this impact these five things? Identity, purpose, marriage, parenting, community. Now, if you've been with us for a while, you'll know that we have a big heart to see marriages healthy. Why? Because a healthy marriage builds a healthy family, and healthy families build a healthy nation. Amen? And healthy marriages and families are built on Jesus, the foundation. Not just who He is, but what He says. Amen? So we want to get to that place where we live this out. I think we're going to do a few sessions on our first impact topic called identity. Because as I was praying into this and reading the scriptures, I felt God show me this is going to take a while to go through this. And he showed me something that, that caught me off guard a little bit. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You'll see the message title for today is idolatrous identity. Idolatrous identity. Now that may sound like a big word or a weird term for some of us, but... It, it comes back to that thing called, who are you worshiping? Because <laughs> there might be idols in our lives. All right, so we're going we're gonna to look into, into that. But before we get there, I want us to see how each foundation, now again, these notes are in the, the event on the YouVersion Bible app, if you want to follow with me. So we're going to look at how has these foundations, how does it impact identity? First one, repentance. How does repentance impact my identity? Well, I realize that I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and I choose to turn away from my old self and towards God. You remember in that teaching that we, 
we said the Greek word metanoia means to turn around completely, a 180 degrees turn. Um, for some of the Afrikaans people, a 360 de degree turn is you're just back where you ended up, where you started. So <laughs> it's a 180 degree turn. Uh, but we also looked at the Hebrew term sheen bet, which means burn down the house. And we, and we saw that if we burn down the house, get rid of the old man, and we turn around to God, there's nothing to go back to. We can only go to God. Amen? So that's how our identity is impacted by repentance. Salvation impacts our identity by, by the fact that I know I am saved by grace through faith, and I am now a child of God, and I can cry out with the spirit of adoption, Abba, Father, to the Almighty God, the Creator of universe. This is massive. I now know that I am a child of God. That is my salvation, meaning to my identity. How does faith impact my identity? I have received a gift of faith, a measure of faith, and I choose to exercise it exclusively in my relationship with God by putting all my faith in Him. Amen? How does lordship and obedience impact my identity? Jesus is Lord, Christ, and King. That was our message on this. But now I realize it. He always was. He always will be. But when I realize He is King, Christ, and Lord, that changes how I look at Him, my life, and myself. Amen? And when I accept that He is my Lord, it has a huge impact on how I decide, live my life, and all those things. Water baptism. How does it impact my identity? My old man is washed away. Sorry, I see there's a typo in the notes. It's not own man. It's old man is washed away. I am now a new creation, no longer in condemnation. That's from Romans 5. Holy Spirit baptism. How does that impact my identity? I receive the Spirit of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit, which brings power to my life and access to the supernatural. It changes everything. How does spiritual family impact my identity? My spiritual family, my church community, my local church community is now my new family in God where I choose to commit by serving and submitting to leadership. All of this will impact who I am. And the last one, discipleship, is the process of maturing in my identity in Christ through meaningful relationships with the people in my spiritual family where accountability is key to the people in the church, all right? So can you see how our foundations are now impacting who we are, all right? So wh why are we talking about idolatrous identity? I believe is a first step into studying the impact of our identity on our identity by our foundations. I believe God wants us to look at and deal with a very important aspect of being a real born-again Christian, idolatrous identity. We're going to look at a passage in Ezekiel, and then I want to show us how important this issue is to God and how it can easily be a blind spot for us as believers in moving forward in our walk with Jesus and in being effective in our walk in Jesus. If you take anything away from today, you know, I want you to know this. The crux of the message is that you are or will become who or what you worship. You are or will become who or what you worship. In other words, whatever you give most of your time, money, and efforts to is your God and will determine who you are. It will determine your identity. You are who you serve. It's just how it is. I'm going to read you a scripture. It may not be a very well-known one, but this blew my mind. And I believe it's going to do something in our spirit man today. So I want you to, to really listen, really engage. And, uh, and through all of this, what I want you to hear is the heart of our Father God for His people. How He longs for them to just love Him and nothing else. Amen? All right. Ezekiel 8, from verse 5 to 18. Now, what has happened here is that Ezekiel had another vision where he felt God take him up between earth and heaven 
and show him what is going on in God's temple. It's almost like there are secret, secret things happening behind the scenes at the temple of God, and God is lifting the veil and showing Ezekiel, this is what's actually happening. The people may look like they serve me, but this is what's really happening, all right? So we pick it up in verse 5. It says, Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now towards the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was the image, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. There's a carved image of jealousy in God's temple, put there by people. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of God, Son of Man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commit here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Abominations committed in the temple of God makes God want to move away from his sanctuary. Now, turn again. You will see greater abominations. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there every sort of creeping thing, abominable, be abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. And in their midst stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. And then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken this land. They think they can get away with it. And he said to me, Turn again, and you will see greater abominations than they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, the women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz is the god of fertility. So the women were wanting to get pregnant, weeping before a foreign god that has no life, hoping that it will give them life in their bellies. And they are crying to this god instead of the god who gives life. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again and you will see greater abominations than these. It's like every time it goes, it's a level up. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men, listen to this, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. They literally turned their backs on the temple of the Lord. And they are facing towards the east, and they were worshiping the sun towards the east. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing that the house of Judah took, uh, to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? And they have filled the land with violence. What is the fruit of idolatry? The land is filled with violence. What are we seeing everywhere? In the world, the land is filled with violence. Then they have returned to provoke my anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their own nose, to their nose. Therefore, I also will act in fury. Listen to the language of the Lord here. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. This is the heart of a father, of if you think of the, the marriage between God and his covenant relationship with Israel and also how he showed Hosea that he is like Hosea and the children of God, the Isra Israelites, is like the harlot that God made Hosea marry. That is what we need to see here. He is a husband aching for his wife's full devotion. I'm going to get into that more a bit later. Our next verse is Exodus 20, verse 3 to 6. We're not going to put all the verses up on the screen today, but it is in the YouVersion Bible app. Exodus 20, from verse 3 to 6. You shall have no other gods before me. 
Where is this from? Does anyone know? You can put it in the notes. <laughs> Ach, in the comments. This is Exodus 20, verse 3 to 6. This is from the Ten Commandments. God is saying to his people, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Make for yourself a carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them to serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. There it is. The contrast that no one wants to know. <laughs> you either love me or you hate me. There is no in between. When God spoke to the churches in Revelation, he said you are lukewarm. If only you were hot or cold. But if you are lukewarm, if you think you are in between and you're safe, one leg kind of serving God, another leg kind of serving the world, you think you're okay, I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven. God is a jealous God. He wants all of our heart devoted to Him. Why? Because He's giving us all of His heart. And we were created to serve only Him. We are not created to serve anything else. Isaiah 42, 17. Now today, the scripture we used for the worship was also from Isaiah 42. This is a bit further down. It says, this is a more positive, <laughs> positive prophecy about what will happen eventually with the people of God. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed who trusted in carved images, who say to the molded images, you are my gods. There will be a moment of repentance. But in the scripture, we see how God knows that when his people serve carved images, stuff they made up and worship, they are not in intimate relationship with him and they are missing him completely. John 15, verse 10 Verse 4 to 10, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He is telling them that he is like the vine of uh, the, the grape, grape plant. Sorry, not str struggling with the term. He is the vine and we are the branches in the vine. And God the Father is the wine dresser, the farmer taking care of the whole thing. And he says in verse 4, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. He keeps repeating the same thing because he wants us to get this. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. You are either grafted in the branch, in the vine, or you're not. You can't be grafted into this vine and that vine. You can't. It's impossible. He, um, if anyone does not abide in me. All right, so he's first saying what will happen if you do abide. This is what happens if you don't abide. He is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt. If you abide in me, he comes back. And my words abide in you. What does that mean? If you are obedient, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Some people take this verse and they abuse it. Saying that if I'm a Christian, I can ask for anything. The red Ferrari and I will get it. Because it's a desire in my heart. But what they are missing is this first part. Abide in me, and I abide. What does abide mean? It means that I am completely staying in God, in Christ Jesus. I am completely tethered to Him. He is my life source. A branch in, on the vine is getting all His nourishments, all the food He needs, the water, 
the nutrients, the minerals, everything is coming through the vine for the branch to grow and bear fruit. Now, if you abide in Jesus, then your, the things you want will change to what he wants. So what this verse is saying, that if you abide in me, you will become more like me. You will think more like me. And then your desires will be in line with my will. Amen? It's not name it, claim it, frame it. It is having an intimate relationship with the living God and coming in line with His will and then, then praying His will and then seeing it come to pass. We are not in relationship with Jesus to see our own kingdoms built. We are in relationship with Jesus to see His kingdom built. Amen? By this, my Father is glorified. So if we abide and we pray what we want according to His will, the Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. He wants to see us bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. I also uh, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So he's saying, abide in my love. And he says then what that looks like. Abide in my love. Um, and then he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus is saying to us, I'm the ultimate example. I'm intimate with the father. I am abide in the father. And, bec- and the way that you know I abide in the father is I obey his commandments. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was sweating blood. He was crying. You're saying, God, if this cup can be taken away from me. It was not his will. And then he says, but not my will be done. Your will be done. And the whole world was changed. Because he said, not my will be done. If we abide in Jesus, (laughs) that is how we will pray. I want to show you something about the word idolatry. I like words and puns and the way things work. And, and I, I felt God show me this in this word. So if you take the word idolatry and you break it up, you hear, I doll a tree. Okay? Now, what was idolatry in the Bible? They took wood from trees and they carved out images and they worshipped them. They also made it from other things. But it's right there in the word in a funny way, I doll a tree, okay? So if you think of the word idolatry, you must think of the stuff that I made or someone else made, and I am now worshiping it, okay? We see over and over again in the Old Testament, God as a father communicating through his appointed leaders and prophets over generations, one simple thing. It never changes, that the people of God just can't seem to get right. I am your God. I love only me and no other gods. That is the message. I am your God. I love you. You need to love me back and not serve anything else. That is, that is what it is because the Bible is actually a beautiful love story between God and his people. And the fact that he loves us so much and his grace is so massive <laughs> that he keeps giving us chances, but there are consequences to the choices. We see that over and over again. We learn from these kinds of passages that many of the idols were literally made by hand from stone, wood, silver, gold, etc. In many scriptures, God and his prophets rebuke Israel and Judah for choosing to rather worship things they made with their own hands than the God who made everything. There are many passages where, where, where they, say, they, they use strong language and say, why are you worshiping a dead thing, a deaf and dumb thing that you made? Why? We know that when the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines and they put it in their temple, the next day their god, Dagon, was flat on the floor. It fell on his face. Another dead god that means nothing. And they kept trying to put him back. And he fell again, and they said, we need to get rid of this ark. (laughs) Because the presence of God 
cannot be in the presence of another God. Amen? From our scriptures, it's very clear that God is a jealous God. He says in so many words, I am a jealous God who does not want to share my, your love, affection, attention, devotion, and commitment. Doesn't want to share it. Who of you are married? Anyone married here online? If you're married, just put up a little emoji hand. Tell us, I'm married. Now, I want to ask you this. I want you to imagine that you find out that your spouse is stepping out on you with someone else. Okay? They are cheating on you. You confront them, and their response is, well, yeah, but it's only for an hour a week. The rest of the time, I'm with you. How would you feel? How would you respond? But don't we do that with God? And yet in the Bible and in our time now, people disobey the first two commandments in many different ways. Those first two that are read from Exodus. And ultimately it means we do not really love God. We love something else. But like when Jesus spoke on money, he clearly stated you cannot serve God and mammon. You can only serve one master. You will either hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve both. Okay, so what does it look like in our daily lives today? Well, let's ask ourselves, which things, things in your life, physical, material things, activities, things that you do, hobbies, sport, whatever it might be, dreams, things you think you want to do, habits, things you do often, every day, it just becomes part of your life, people, uh, it could be spouse, children, family, etc., do, what are these things do I have in my life that takes up more of my time, energy, and focus than God? Most of us do not schedule God into our diaries. I don't know about you guys, but we have a crazy Google calendar just to run our lives, all right? We, I have a calendar. My wife has a calendar. We have a calendar for the kids, and then there's a work. It's crazy. So when you look at Google calendar, it's like, all these colors staring back at you of things that need to happen. But what I personally don't have in there is time with God. And I've, I'm guilty of waking up some mornings and going, ah, I'm just too tired to spend time with God today. I'm just going to lie in. God will understand. But that same day, I would have an entry in my diary for an important meeting that could mean something to my career my, my job I'm doing, whatever it might be. And if I'm late, I feel bad. And I apologize. And I also will rush in traffic to get there in time if I'm late. What is that? That is serving something else. And thinking that God is somehow less important. And listen to me carefully. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about you have to do this because you have to. No. What do I really love? What do I really prioritize? If I really love God, I can't wait to get to Him. I can't wait to spend time with Him. I can't wait to make Him a part of everything I'm doing. Amen? I'm not standing here preaching this because I've got this down. <laughs> I felt God preach to me this week. And I'm standing here humbly admitting that I need to work at this as much as I'm sure many of you realize we need to do. Not work as in our own efforts, but to actually just come and say, Lord, I repent and I surrender. We invest in the markets. We invest in cryptocurrencies. We start multi-level marketing businesses and every five seconds we check, what's it doing? How's it growing? How's, what does it look like on the app? What can I do to increase my, my, my growth? What can I do, to, you know? And we, we realize that I'm looking way more at my app and my phone than I'm actually reading the Word of God. And did God even tell me to invest this in these funds? If He did, great, that's wonderful. But if He didn't, you maybe need to take a step back and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm serving mammon. I'm serving money. I want to serve you. 
show me where to wisely invest in a kingdom way so that I can serve my local church, so that I can help people who don't have food, so I can help a missionary to send the gospel to a place that's never heard it before, whatever it might be. But if it's only serving you and your kingdom in the dreams that you have, then it is not in line with God's will. And the one we're probably all the most guilty of is our smart devices. Amen? These things. They take over our lives. Just ask your kids, what do they think is more important to you? Your smartphone or they? They will quickly tell you (laughs) what they think of that. All right, I want to go back to Ezekiel 8 for a moment and then come back down again because this is such a powerful scripture. I want you to imagine for a second that you are like Ezekiel and God is coming to you and saying, my son, my daughter, I want to show you something. Do you know what's going on behind the scenes? And then I want you to imagine that God is somehow lifting you up. And he's, instead of taking you to a physical temple with priests and people inside there, he takes you to you, your heart, your mind, your spirit. Why? Because in the new covenant... When I give my life to Christ, the Bible says I am now the temple of God. And God wants to show you today. He wants to lift the veil and say, have you seen this? As we walk into the door, there's an image of jealousy. As we turn around the corner, there's another idol of bitterness. In this room, there's an image that's all about fear and worry. You spend a lot of time in this room. You spend a lot of time bowing down to this image. There's another room filled with money, investments, all kinds of stuff. God says to you, wow, you, you spent extra time in this room. It's quite big. But after you go to the worry room, you go to this room quite a lot. He's lifting up all these things. And I want you to to let this sink in. He calls it abominations. Now, I'm saying this the same way God said this to Ezekiel, because he kept telling him, do you see this, son of man? Do you realize what this means? And I know this is not, what I'm saying is not popular. It's not making you feel good and fuzzy on the inside. But if you take this word, it will bring you closer to God. It will help you to get rid of the clutter and the noise. And it will help you to come into that place where you, it's not wrong to have these things. I'm not saying that. Remember, the root of all evil is not money. It's the love of money. That's the root of all kinds of evil. So what is God saying? If you have a a problem with fear, worry, and anxiety, if you are jealous of someone all the time, if you are coveting someone else's possessions, if you say, post a picture of your children and say, hashtag my everything, If, if you... If you think your spouse is the be-all and end-all and you basically worship your spouse, whatever it might be, God is saying, if you love that thing or person more than me, that is the problem. Because then it becomes an abomination. It's when you turn your back on God and you trust something or someone else. And what are we mostly trying to achieve security of some kind. We think that the right salary at the right company with the right benefits is security. So what are we doing? We're serving that company and ultimately mammon, money, because you think that's security. What are the conversations we have around 
fries and barbecues and all these things. A lot of the time, it's about these things. How's your crypto doing? You know? How's your investments doing? Do you have enough money saved up for your children to go to, uh, to university? Do you have this? Do you have that? And when you speak to a financial advisor, it's like, whoa, I'm not ready. <laughs> And then there's worry and fear. And then you try to do it in your own strength. And, you have all the, and then we are on this rat race all the time. Why? Because somewhere in all these conversations, we allow the enemy to use these things to distract us from the source of everything. God. And guys, we must get away from this thing where we think that God is an abstract idea that we spend time on on a Sunday. He is living. He is a person. He longs for intimacy with every one of us. He wants no one to perish. He wants everyone to come to him. He died for everyone so that they can have eternal life. But there's a cost. The cost is you need to die. The old you has to die. We spoke on that when we had the baptism service. It's a symbolic expression of what happens on the inside. The old man is washed away, and the new man, the new person rises with Christ and can live this way because we have access to the supernatural strength and ability to do so through the Holy Spirit. But you can't get saved one day and live perfectly the next day, it's a process. And a big part of that process is actually waking up each day and saying, God, I put you first. What are the first thoughts that go through our minds when we wake up? Am I picking up my phone and checking how many messages that I get through the night? Or am I turning to God? Who is the most important thing in my life? Or what? God is coming to us like Ezekiel today and saying, come on, let us lift the veil a little bit and see what's really going on here. And you can be like the 70 elders who says, well, God doesn't know what we're doing. He's left us. In this week, I had a message from someone who we've been trying to counsel on the phone because she's not close. But she says, I just give up. I give up on God. God has given up on me. Apparently, this is not for me. I'm just, my heart breaks because she believes a lie about who she is. She believes a lie. Okay, I want to show you who you really are in Christ. The question is, will you believe it? And you know what the biggest enemy of that belief, that who you are in Christ really is? It's the idols in your life that's blocking the true knowledge of who you are in Christ. Ephesians 1, from verse 3 to 9. I think I have that up there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Listen to this. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. From where? The heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Whoa, you chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be, what, holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise and the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace which He has made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure. Guys, if you have really repented, gotten saved, Put your faith in Jesus, walking a road of lordship and obedience. You've been water baptized, Holy Spirit. Many of us may feel this way, is that we have an idolatrous identity. We are not only serving Him. 
We are serving other stuff as well. In other words, we are not fully and completely sold out to Jesus as our only God and Savior. We have another backup plan, a system in place that we actually trust more than we trust God. And this system can be anything, like I trust doctors, I trust their opinion. I trust the pharmaceutical companies who give me medicine that makes me feel better. Um, there's a culture that I grew up in. This is a big one, guys. In most cultures around the world where missionaries have gone long before and there's a, there's a, a, a form of Christianity, what has actually happened is that people disobeyed the second commandment. They carved an idea of who God is. And then they made it a part of their culture. And then they worship their culture. We have that in the Afrikaans tradition. We, I see it in many other cultures in our nation. This thing happened. Where the word of God is not the ultimate authority. But what people say and what people decide. M- rules made by man. Rituals made by man. That becomes more important or as important as the word of God. So who are you really serving? We can worship our parents and their advice. We can take more heed of what they say than God himself. Now, the Bible says, honor your father and mother and you will have a long life. Yes. But they can never trump the word of God. The way you communicate something that's contrary to what your parents are saying is, I've prayed about this. I believe this is what God is saying. And I understand that you have concerns or that you have another idea. But respectfully, I I need to go with what God has said. There's a way to honor your parents even when you disagree with them. Because, But the question is, has God spoken or have you spoken? That's the difference. You can worship your spouse. You can think that's the best person in the world. And I rely on them so much that they actually become a God to you. You can worship your children. They can be more important than God. You can worship fear and worry. And like we saw with Ezekiel, jealousy. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, when we are not fully devoted only to God, our creator, our source of life, the one who gives order and structure and healthy boundaries and life in abundance, we cannot see our true identity and destiny in Christ. Other gods, other idols, other things we worship, what do they do? They distort disrupt and destroy our view of God. And when we can't see God clearly, we can't see ourselves clearly in Him. That's what it does. Listen, if you do not see God as the God of the Bible, then you don't see Him correctly. If you don't see God as the God of the Bible, you don't see Him the right way. And therefore, you don't serve Him correctly. The most deceptive idol to serve is your own idea of who the God of the Bible is. Do you understand that? The most deceptive idol to serve is the idea of God that you created and said, yes, that's God, I serve him. But if the God that you say you serve don't match up with the Bible, the word, the the God of the Bible, then you're serving an idol that you made up. Amen? It's like if I draw a picture of my wife on a piece of paper, and I say, this is my wife, but she's standing right here in person. I say, this is my wife. Someone's going to think I'm nuts. Like, no, that's a drawing, a bad drawing of your wife. This is your wife. But this is what we do. We say, God, whoa, I'm completely and utterly freaked out and overwhelmed by how big you are, and I will never understand you or the mystery of who you are. So I would rather make something I can understand and define and put in my pocket and walk with than serve the living God that overwhelms me. It started back in the Old Testament when the people of Israel came to Samuel and said, we need a king. And he said, you have a king. He is God. And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't want to deal with him. We want to have a, a human being. Samuel went to God and said, the people want the king. God said, I am their king. Samuel said, I know, I told them that. He said, go back and tell them again. He told them. They said, no, we want a king. They went, he went back to God. God said, okay, give them a king. 
But tell them, he's going to tax them, he's going to steal their land, he's going to steal their animals, and it's not going to be great for them. So Samuel did that, and they still said yes. Now, it's easy to judge that way of thinking when we see someone else doing it. But what if God is lifting the veil in your temple today and showing you you're doing exactly the same thing? With your work, the hours you're putting in, what are you slaving away for? Did God even tell you to do that job? Did God tell you to move there? On that note, every one of you that are moving or are thinking of moving or have already emigrated to another country out of fear and not because God said so, repent. Turn around. Come back or just repent and talk to God about it. If he says you can stay, sure. But do not make this mistake. Because what you've done, if you haven't consulted God, is you moved because you're worshiping fear. It's that simple. You can, you can dress it up and say, no, but I want a better future for my children. You don't know what's going to happen in the country you move to in a week from now, a month from now, a year from You don't know. God knows. Is your hope in the news the government, the government of that country? Or is your hope in God? Who are you serving? God is the word. So, he is the word. So, if you change the word or leave something out in the word because it's more convenient for you, then you are essentially creating your own God. And when you serve that made-up God, that idol, then that is what's going to form your identity. <laughs> this is hectic, guys. And I feel very convicted myself. And I need to seriously think and go, make sure that I'm serving God with all that I am. And I want you to do the same thing. Okay, so here's another question. Do you like who you are right now? Are you happy with your identity, with who you are right now? If you are not, I want to ask you, who are you serving? Who are you really serving? There's a fairly well-known saying in Christian circles. You may have heard this before. It even features in a well-known worship song. I've used it a lot myself. It says, I know who I am because I know whose I am. But this can go both ways. <laughs> and you could be wrong. Because we don't actually say that because I know whose I am and that whose is God. Or you just say, I am whose I am. But I, this is actually confirming my whole message today. My identity is linked to who or what I worship. I am. I know who I am because I know whose I am. But is that really the God of the Bible? Whose you are. And yes, in principle, you are, but are you completely accepting the real, re the real truth of what that means? That is the question we have today. I want us to reflect and respond and ask God, what are the idols we honestly have in our lives? And then we need to repent and lay them down and choose to make God our first love and highest priority in all things. What I did not say today is that you shouldn't have dreams, passions, desires, shouldn't have a family, shouldn't have this. I did not say that. What I did say and what the Word of God is saying is that none of those things that God has given us, that we are blessed with, can become more important than Him. That's important. God is not saying that we can't be wealthy and be blessed and bless others. But what are you serving? Him or the money? We have to be very careful where our devotion truly lies. It's great to be in a godly marriage. But my wife and I need to constantly remind ourselves and each other 
God is the most important third party in our marriage. He comes first. If we are in a disagreement, then we turn to Him and His Word. If we have to make big decisions or even small decisions, we go to Him. Lord, what do you say? When the world screams one thing, you should be doing this, this is the right thing to do, don't just jump on board and do what the world says because then you're serving them. Go to God. Go to His Word. Say, Lord, what do you say? And then you do (laughs) what He says. Amen? I want you to stand wherever you are and, and just close your eyes, reach up to heaven and ask God to lift that veil on the temple of your own life today. Say, Lord, if there are any, if there's any wicked way in me, search me and know me, show me, Lord. If there are anything that's more important in my life than what you are or should be, show me, Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit shows you today, I want you to recognize it. I want you to admit it. And I want you to repent from it. Really lay it down in prayer. And then make a conscious decision with your spouse or whoever is walking with you, discipling you. Say, help me to to get rid of this thing and to walk in a new healthy way in this area of my life. Amen. All right. We're going to sing a combination of I exalt thee and to worship you I live. And let's just take this moment to reflect and respond.
Holy Spirit, we ask right now that you will lift the veil. those things and you lay them down before him and you say Lord I repent all these things I want to burn before you because they are not you I thank you for everything you've given me but all of these things my talents my opportunities the people in my life the gifts I have the physical material things I own all of them exist to serve you help me lord to live in complete devotion only to you save me from these other gods and idols help me to never let them back in and help me to serve you and you alone in jesus name we pray amen I want to thank you for joining us today from wherever I trust and I believe that God spoke powerfully to each and every one of us and I trust that you've had a real encounter with him that helps you to align with his purposes so that you can reign in life and help others to do the same I trust that you'll have an amazing week and we look forward to seeing you next week God bless you bye-bye